It's my honor to introduce my very good friend, uh, Rigo Butandu. Uh, Rigo and I got acquainted when he came to this university and enrolled in the LLM program. He received his Master of Laws degree from the J. Reuben Clark Law School in the year 2000. And, um, and then uh, before coming here, Rigo had uh, studied law and received his first law degree from the University of Kinshasa in Zaire. He had practiced law in Kinshasa, where he served in the uh, immigration department dealing with issues of uh, foreigners with human rights, uh, uh, security of the nation, sometimes advising the president of the country about uh, important issues relating to state security, the kinds of issues that we are very concerned with in this country today since 9-11. Um, uh, following the coup d'etat in, in, uh, in Zaire, uh, Rigo and his family uh, moved uh, to South Africa where he served uh, as a legal advisor and he also studied, if I recall, st studied law f at the University of Pretoria um, and did some legal advisory work, though not practicing law, but using his legal skills. Then he came here and received his degree. He's worked uh, and, and clerked for law firms in this country, uh, returned to South Africa, returned here with his wife Marta and their children. Uh, Marta is a nurse and uh, they've been settled in New Mexico and are now moving to California. Uh, Rigo has written a fascinating book. I got the privilege to read some of his work because he wrote a, a thesis for his master's program and it had to do with the legitimacy of governments and with uh, uh, the legitimacy of governments established by coup d'etat, focusing on his own knowledge and research of those experiences and incidents in Africa. Fascinating subject, a subject that has been much ignored by the United States, much to our, um, to our embarrassment, frankly, in, in our diplomatic uh, field. Um, but Rigo, I thought of you recently, just uh, last week when I went to a new movie called The Interpreter. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but it uh, focuses on um, violence and legitimacy and un instability in a, an African nation. Uh, and uh, just a few months ago, another wonderful movie, very powerful movie, Hotel Rwanda. So the issue has not been entirely forgotten. It's an issue that is coming more to the foreign consciousness of Americans, uh, one that we need to look. It's an overlooked and neglected part of our uh, diplomatic portfolio, I think. And I look forward to hearing your remarks today. Rigo Butandu. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, Lori asked me just, uh, Cory asked me to just to feel free and uh, to take this as if it was a church. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, they don't have glass of water at the church without a style of this. How many of you have ever heard of the African First World War in this room? One person? Okay. Uh, let me just ask you, what did you hear about it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's, that's part of it. Okay. Um, this book... Forgotten War actually speaks about that African uh, First World War. And that's the way that the Clinton administration labeled that, uh, that war. And the war took place between August the 2nd of 1998 to almost the end of October 2002. And in that war, there was about half a dozen of professional regular armies, African armies, that were involved, directly involved, uh, without counting uh, the different militias uh, that were also involved. And um, however, was that war uh, a rebellion, as, um, as we know it? Or was it something else? Was it an aggression from um, foreign states into another, uh, into another state, in this case, the Democratic Republic of Congo? Uh, former Zaire or not, so we're going to talk about it. 
Uh, but let me first go and give you a historical uh, overview of this. Um, as my, my friend pointed, in 1990, there was what we know as a revival or the birth of democracy uh, in Eastern Europe and uh, extending to uh, other parts of the world, and Africa was not uh, uh, left for that. So there was what we call like a fever of uh, democracy everywhere. Everybody wanted democracy and so on. And at the same time, um, Rwanda was already in a state of civil war. There was civil war in Rwanda. And on the 6th of April, 1991, uh, the plane carrying the president of Rwanda, um, his name is uh, Juvenal Habiarimana, and the president of uh, Burundi, uh, Cyprian uh, Tariamira, was shot down just as they were approaching Kigali. Kigali is the capital city of Rwanda. And that's how the genocide started. And uh, what happened, the people were um, in government at the time were Hutus, or the majority, because the Hutus are the majority, and they came and uh, sought refuge in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this happened all the time, going back uh, from before the time of independence, as from 1955, we have uh, civil wars when one tribe is in power. In Rwanda, you have the Tutsi in power, and then the Hutus who just find refuge in, uh, in Congo and in, in neighboring country, and vice versa. So that's what happened. And at the same time that I was talking about that uh, revival of democracy in Africa, in the Congo, uh, Mobutu, that many of you know, um, was becoming really, really has already reached what we call um, uh, his apogee as far as uh, his uh, government was concerned with human rights violation, corruption, and everything that you can name. And the West were concerned about him. They wanted to replace him because he didn't want any democratization in, in his country. Because, uh, though um, uh, the experience shows in Africa, maybe in other parts of the world, that they will go and allow uh, multipartism, but multipartism is not equal to uh, democracy. So that's what happened. So therefore, Mobutu, at the same time, could not really protect the interest of the West. So he had to be replaced. By all means, he had to be replaced. And um, then, uh, Yuri Museveni, the president of Uganda, and Paul Kagame, who at the time was um, the vice president of Rwanda and uh, the minister of defense, um, approached, or maybe the other way around, the State Department, and uh, they said to them, well, we know somebody, mostly Yuri Museveni, said that I know a guy, actually, who can be in power. And at the same time, uh, there was too much of um, political instability in the Congo. Uh, the, the leader of the political opposition, Etienne Chisekedi, uh, was elected as the Prime Minister of Congo. But he couldn't get into power. I think he was in, in, in his cabinet for about three months, then Mobutu would kick him out, and that's what happened. So uh, Mobutu, therefore, had to be um, uh, taken uh, out. Then um, Yuri Museveni um, you know, introduced Kabila, uh, Laurent Desert Kabila, not the one who's in power today in the DRC, but his father. He introduced him to the other guys from the West, saying that, I know this man since the bush of, um, of Tanzania, where we're uh, training for our guerrilla war. So he helped Museveni to come into power in 1985. And uh, this will be the best person for us. So then started what is known as the, um, uh, the Afdel um, War of Liberation against the Congo. Started in the east, eastern part of the Congo uh, in 1996 and 1997. On the 17th of May 1997, they got into power in Kinshasa and Mobutu ran away. He went to Togo, I think, for a few weeks. And then he was in exile in Morocco where he died uh, a few months later. And um, when Kabila came into power, when he was progressing from the eastern part of the Congo to the capital city, um, he was helped as well by um, some um, uh, multinational corporations. And uh, he already had signed some deals with them, money deals mostly. Um, so when he came into power now and he has established his government, he found out that those concessions that he did with those multinationals were not fair. There was no fair bargaining. Therefore, he wanted to review those uh, concessions, and uh, these guys have invested money to him, and he have canceled some of the concessions. So he became annoying. Um, they call him that he was incontrollable. And at the meantime, um, the Congolese army and all the different um, security services were controlled directly by Rwandan and Ugandan officers, but mostly Rwandan officers, because when they came into power, 
uh, Kigali or Rwanda wanted a guarantee from the, from the, the DR Congo that they have to control the army so they can protect the border, the eastern borders, because they always accuse the Hutus who find refuge in the Congo of getting back into their country and um, targeting the populations. So that's what happened. And that means also because of the increase of the um, foreign armies in the Congo and mostly in Kinshasa, uh, people were unhappy, were unhappy because of that uncivil um, conduct of those foreign armies, um, you know, going from human rights violation not only onto uh, the people but also against their properties. So they were, they were not happy. And then there were so many uh, plots to, that were uncovered to, uh, to kill Kabila. And that situation led to Kabila ending the um, foreign assistance, the military foreign assistance with Rwanda and Uganda and any other country involved like uh, Burundi on the 28th of July 1998. So uh, the marriage was, uh, was over. Now, before I continue, let me just tell you something about um, the Banyamulenge, Banyamulenge group, as it's called. The Banyamulenge group are the Tutsi, are the Rwandan Tutsi, but who live in the Congo from the time where all the uh, uh, civil unrest was taking place in Rwanda. So they are called uh, Banyamulenge. And um, something very particular here about them is whenever the Tutsi are in power in Rwanda, the Banyamulenge will behave themselves as if uh, they were the owners of the lands, the lords of the lands. And that conduct was annoying as well to the Congolese people who have received them into their country, uh, you know, as refugees. So and then um, when the Hutus were running, when the Tutsis are in power in, in, uh, in Rwanda, and the Hutu, because of what they were trying to plan, maybe to overthrow the government, and when they chase them, they come to the Congo, and the eastern part of the Congo uh, on the border, they found the uh, Banyamulenge were the Tutsi Rwandan. So there were clashes, there were military clashes all the time. So that's what, that's what happened. That's why the confusion until today uh, still exists. Now, as I pointed out at the beginning, the war uh, broke out on the 2nd of August, uh, 2000, 1998, or four days after uh, foreign military assistance was, um, was terminated by the Congolese government. And when the war started, Rwanda sent troops or the Rwandan troops actually were asked to deploy, go back to the country, went to the border uh, cities, and remained there. And they say, or the Rwandan government say that they have to come back to the Congo because Kabila was an Mobutu, which means what? That there was no democracy in the Congo. He was corrupted, and uh, he didn't respect human rights. And um, that was laughable, and I will tell you why. That was the first reason. The second reason they say that we have to come to protect um, a plan to, um, to kill the Banyamulenge. There will be a genocide against the Banyamulenge, so we have to come back so we can protect these people. This is four days after they were asked to, to leave the country. And the third reason they said they have to come back to the Congo to protect the borders, their borders, from infiltration of Hutu militias into, into Rwanda. Now, as I pointed out, when they were in charge of the Congolese army, by the way, the chief of staff, the general chief of staff of the Congolese armies was a Rwandan, and he is the actual chief of staff or general chief of staff of the Rwandan armies. He was in charge of the Congolese armies from the time Kabila came into power to the time when they were asked to leave the country. And um, uh, talking about Kabila being another Mobutu, um, that assertion really is laughable because the way they accuse him, it was as if in Rwanda and Uganda there is, uh, there is a functioning democracy. There isn't. And also as if he was actually a governor of one of the provinces, or Rwanda and Uganda actually were part of the Congo. Then they say, well, the president is not really a good man. We have to kick him out because we are part of the Congolese uh, territory. And, but these are the correct versions. The correct versions are that they came to the Congo because of political control. Of the, of the country and for the conquest of the Congolese natural and mineral resources, mostly called coltan. And also they had a plan, which was a plan B, that if ever something happened, we will go and we will stay and there will be a buffer zone and then we will start the balkanization of the Congo. So that, that is the true, the true vision. And um, 
why, why am I speaking about international consp uh, conspiracy? As I ask here, um, how many of you have ever heard about this word? It was only one person who spoke, who showed his hands. But well, that doesn't mean that maybe you, you heard it indirectly or you heard it in another way. But what is a conspiracy? A conspiracy is an, is an, agree is an agreement uh, by two or more people to commit an unlawful act or is a combination for unlawful uh, purpose. And an agreement can be either you know, implied or expressed. You don't really have to express it. It doesn't have to be on paper so that it can be an agreement. And the first thing that I'm going to speak about, speaking uh, concerning the conspiracy, is about the response of the international community. When I'm speaking about the international community, I'm also speaking about myself and you and any, uh, everybody else. Okay? Now, what was the response of the AU, the African Union? The African Union was just incompetent. <laughs> As it was 10 years or 20 years ago, and it is today, they couldn't do anything. Okay? What about the AU? The EU, the European Union was just confused. They were divided. And they were unwilling to intervene in the Congo because of different um, uh, conflict of interest that they had. What about the US? Well, when Kabila came into power in 1997, the um, Congolese armies that he recruited, the people that he recruited in the eastern part of the Congo, were trained by Rwandan officers. And Rwanda received intelligence and training from US military, okay? Therefore, when Rwanda and Uganda invaded, invaded the country, they had received intelligence from the US as well as the training. And the second thing that the US did, they asked that all the troops involved in that war have to pull out. And I'm going to name those countries that were involved. Rwanda had about 22,000. Officially, that's what they say. And you know when uh, it comes from, uh, from people like that, from government who have invaded another country, they speak about having 22,000, probably you have to add 5,000 more on top, okay? And um, Uganda had 9,000. And those are the two countries. Burundi as well has about well, 1,500 1, um, troops. Then the Congo invited Zimbabwe, that had 11,000, Namibia, uh, about 2,000, and Angola, I think about 1,200. Um, Chad came for about a few months, then they were, there was too much pressure against France so that Chad can, um, can, can take his troops out. So the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution, uh, resolution um, 815 of uh, the 9th of April 1999, <coughs> or the 10th of July, I'm sorry, 1999. In that resolution, they came to put in place what is called today the Lusaka Accord. The Lusaka Accord actually is, is a ceasefire accord, where they say, okay, if you want the invaders to leave the country, at each step, if they take 500 troops out of the country, then the allies of the government also have to take step to withdraw the troops. So the U.S. was supporting um, uh, that act. What about the UN? Well, we know what happened in 1991 when Iraq invaded Kuwait. What happened? That, is, that was actually the biggest coalition that ever existed since the Second, the, since the second world, world War II. There was no uh, turning around the bush. They asked Saddam Hussein to get out of Kuwait. He didn't want. So we went in there and we took him out by force. Okay. But why did we have this double... Um, uh, standard policy when it came to Africa. The UN passed a resolution, the resolution, um, the Security Council resolution 1334 uh, of the 9th of April 1999. Now this is nine, eight months after the war began. In that resolution, they didn't even recognize that there were foreign troops in the Congo. They didn't, even though they were facts, coming from en different NGOs and the government of Congo and different governments, they didn't do that. But that resolution was requesting that all the troops have to withdraw, all of them. Okay, here we are being invited by Mexico. I know you laugh, but I assume that Mexico invited the United States. And we call Canada to come and help us. And then some people come because we have uh, an organization that, have to, that has been set in place to resolve conflict in the world. And that organization say, you know what? 
if you want Mexico to withdraw its troops, and Canada also have to withdraw its troops. Uh, that doesn't really make sense, but that's what happened. Okay. That was eight months after the war broke out. And the second resolution was resolution, um, Security Council Resolution 1304 of June um, 16, 2000. That is 22 months after the war uh, began, after the invasion. And um, finally, at that resolution, the Security Council acknowledged that the Congolese um, uh, territory was violated by the invaders. It didn't, they didn't name them, and they asked that those troops that was not invited by the Congolese government have to withdraw. Uh, unfortunately, the flaw that I find here is that they have to withdraw in conformity to the Security Council Resolution 85, uh, 815 of uh, slash 1999 of um, the 10th of July, which requested that every time that the invaders will, uh, will withdraw their troops, the Congolese army also have to ask his allies to withdraw some troops. Okay and also requested that there should be a reparation for uh, damages that um, uh, the people uh, suffer in Kisangani. What happened in Kisangani is that twice during the war, uh, first I think it was in 1999, the Ugandan and Rwandan troops turned guns to each other. They fought uh, in Kisangani, it, hap it happened twice. So that resolution is only speaking about damages that took place there. And during this time, that was in 2001, about two 2.5 million of people have already perished in other parts of the occupied territories of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then they put into place what is called the uh, MONIC. MONIC is the United Nations mission into the, um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So the first part is, as I was talking about, about the, uh, the conspiracy, is the response of the international community, as I just outlined to you. The second part is the international media. What did they do? Well. Uh, they represent corporate interest. That's, that's their characterization. And the same characterization is that they, um, they are known for propaganda and hypocrisy. And they will always generate confusion by fabricating or exaggerating stories. <clears throat> and uh, they will exaggerate facts. And I will point out two here. There was a time um, they said that uh, Kabila, the uh, Kabila government uh, had asked uh, North Korea to send, actually they didn't say that, they said that there were North Korean in, on the ground, on the battleground in the Democratic Republic of Congo, fighting for or allied to the Congolese uh, government. That wasn't true, they also spoke about uh, some uh, uh, missiles that were bought by the Congolese government, and that wasn't true either. Okay. Now, the third um, part of this conspiracy is the international financial institution response during the, the, uh, that war, and I will name the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, what happened, they continued their aid to the invaders. By the way, I don't know if you are aware that the Rwandan budget, 66% of the Rwandan budget is foreign aid. And 53% of the Ugandan budget 50, uh, is, is foreign aid. And during that time, uh, while the war was going on, uh, people have been killed. Um, really, lots of violation of human rights have taken place. Um, there was a major defense procurement uh, in, in, in Uganda. Uganda got uh, 700 million in debt relief from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And the highly indebted poor countries, or HIPC, uh, debt relief initiative. And this is, I don't know if there is any political uh, economist here, uh, that is really an insult. That a country, and the uh, evidence that Uganda aids were actually used to buy uh, weapons that were sent, airlifted into the Democratic Republic of Congo. So there were evidence that um, this money was being used for another purpose than what was uh, required to aid the, the poor people of, uh, of Uganda. And they continue to, to, to help them. Now, um, what are the facts here? What we know during this war, this is what we know. First of all, there was no rebellion. There never been a rebellion in the Congo <clears throat> in 1999. Um, 1998, uh, 2000, 2001, 2002, there was, uh, there was no rebellion. You cannot have 30,000 uninvited, 30, uninvited foreign troops in your country and you call it rebellion. No, there was no rebellion. And um, because it was no rebellion, because it was an invasion, it was an aggression, uh, it was morally and legally wrong. It was not sanctioned by the United Nations. 
And it wasn't even a self-defense because in case of self-defense, you can go and pursue your enemies in uh, the, that foreign country. That didn't happen. And uh, what we know in the record is that uh, they have about 3.5 million people will die as a direct and direct cause of the war. And uh, sexual crimes against women and, and girls were so uh, rampant. And uh, um, Human Rights Watch actually said that never, never in the conflicts of um, in the arm, uh, in the conflicts of um, of such nature, never sexual crimes against women and uh, girls has been so brutal and widespread as it happened in the Congo. And I don't really want to, uh, to get into details because um, it wasn't good. What we also know is that um, there was a systematic and systemic plundering of Congolese resources. Uh, mineral and natural resources and other uh, form of wealth. And the UN panel that was established for that purpose uh, reported on the 12th of April 2001 about what happened. And you can find everything in this book or you can find them on, um, on the website if you, do some, uh, if you do a search. And there was no express con uh, condemnation of the conflict, of the war, or even the violation of human rights that was taking place. Either express condemnation from the U.S. or from the U.N. I will just name those um, two institutions. And uh, curiously, there was no sanction against Rwanda, uh, Uganda, and to, this, to this day. And about two weeks ago, I met um, a gentleman who worked in the Clinton administration when I was in Sacramento for another conference. Um, his name is John um, Prendergast. I think some of you know him. He works now for the International Crisis Group, which is an NGO. He is involved in Darfur and so on. He said to me, you know what, Rigo? Today, the Congolese situation actually is in the holo uh, Holocaust. This is the second Holocaust that we had since the Second World War II. And about six millions of people have died because of this war. And this is actually the first Holocaust in the 21st century. And still, many of us in this room and in this campus in this city, Provo, in this state, Utah, in this country, the U.S., and in the world. Many of us never heard about that war, never heard about what really happened. So to conclude, I have five capital questions. The first one is, why did it happen? Why did the situation in the Congo happen? Just like the situation today in Darfur, what are we doing? We are just fighting, just on administration papers, fighting for control, who is going to send more troops into Darfur. But in the meantime, hundreds of people are dying every day. So why did it happen? Why did the situation happen? And where was I? Where were you? Where was I when it happened? And why did it take us, you and I, why did it take us so long to know about it? And why did it take us so long to know about conflicts in Africa? And what should we do, you and I, what should we do to change this situation? That never, never again it might happen. That's what Clinton said, never it will happen. It will never, never happen again when he spoke about the, the uh, Rwandan genocide. But genocide is happening everywhere. And when are we going to begin that process that we won't st stand uh, idly looking on when uh, gross violation of human rights are taking place? When are we going to begin the process? Is it going to be now? Or is it going to be tomorrow? Or never because we don't care. Because, well, it's not here, it's somewhere else. But my response to that is, if we don't do it today, then we'll never do it. And I thank you for your attention. And now I can tell your questions. Yes. You can use the micro, I will, I will hear you, but I don't know if others will hear you. <laughs> okay. You can, you can. It's wireless. Oh, it is wireless. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're... Those last questions you asked, I mean, you asked rhetorically, like, what can we do? I'm, I'm, I'm just interested, what, what are the answers? I mean, so that we don't have this kind of, you know, guilt of, of just oddly, or, you know, looking on. What, what, what do you suggest? 
<clears throat> well, the, the good thing about, about the U.S. is that um, we are really organized to the, to, the, to the point that if we don't take action, sometimes it is our own fault. Um, just quoting John uh, Prendergast again, what he said is, because he was talking about what we have to do, we don't have to just to, you know, to sit sil silent, not doing anything. He said, people that we elect, um, either at the state level or the local level, you know, cities or at the federal level, those that we send to Washington, they want to hear from us. Sometimes they know about these issues, but they want to know from us. And he said, if 500 people have to write on the same topic to their senators, they will act on that. So we don't just have to wait, we have to, we have to do something. Um, let's do it. Write to them. Yeah, I think some of them have toll free numbers. Um, that's a privilege. I'd like to ask, uh, what do you see as the future role of the African Union? Does it have, can the African Union be significant in strategic affairs in preventing future incidents like this uh, when they come up? And if not, what sort of a role do you think they should play? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. And um, I actually talk about it in my, my second book that might probably be coming out next, next month. Um, the African Union have to do something. This is what I say. Um, just quoting uh, Emery Patrice Lumumba, who was the first um, prime minister in the Congo just after independence. He said, if Africans are exploited, it's because they are exploitable. That's what he said. Now, the African Union, the, the biggest critique that I have against the African Union is the fact that they say something and they do the other thing. And this is because of what I call the back scratching policy. Uh, I will give you an example. Uh, there has been um, democracy over, overdraw in the Congo, I mean in Africa. Burundi and uh, the Republic of Congo. What, what happened? They just watched it. About a few weeks ago, um, another unconstitutional um, event took place in, the, uh, in Togo, where we had a dictator who passed away, and then his son came into power. So then they went to elections. Whatever happened there, um, you and I, or people who live really in a real democracy, won't, won't support it. So the uh, African Union have to go, they have, those leaders have to put the interests of their people above any other interest. They have to understand that they are in those offices, whatever, whatever their position, either in the, in the armies or in the civil um, position that they have, they're holding, they are there because of, they have been elected. So they must put the interests of, um, of their citizen above their own interests. If they do that, then the African Union will be, will be strong. But in the meantime, also we have to understand that um, there are people out there who don't want to see things really change in Africa. Therefore, those who have been put into power have to stand bold and say that, no, I think we have to draw the line now. We have taken this a lot. We cannot support it anymore. But it has to come from Africa themselves. Still, we also ask our, our friends from the West just to stop that intervention when, it, when African leaders want to do something constructive about, about it, um, their nations. Any other question? I'll speak into this microphone, if I may. Rigo, describe the situation in, geographically in the Congo with regard to uh, who's in control where at this particular time and what the situation seems to be in terms of the prognosis, um, uh, uh, in terms of who's controlling what and what interests they represent. Uh, and where is the United States in all of this at this time? I, officially, who are they supporting? Are there troops? Are there advisors? Is there economic support? What about humanitarian aid? Is that coming in to this area or parts of this area? Thank you. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, the situation now in the Congo, um, 
uh, they went, they have uh, what is the, what they call a uh, government of national unity, where they have those uh, former rebels. Well, you have to understand when uh, Uganda and Rwanda invaded the country, uh, as, as usual, you have people who always look for those opportunities, opportunists, uh, who came and uh, they considered themselves into re rebellions. But uh, in truth, if they didn't have the support of foreign troops, they couldn't stand even for two months because uh, they didn't have uh, any power, they didn't have the might, they didn't have any army, they didn't have the money and so on. So um, in 2002, um, in December 2002, um, after the negotiation in Sun City in South Africa, they came and they formed a, a government of national unity. But until last year, some of those um, um, rebel leaders were still having their own militia that they were controlling in the eastern part of the Congo. And the integration into the national government, I mean into the national army, uh, is, was very slow. And uh, today, I think when, anything that you hear today about the Congo is mostly in what is called the uh, Ituri province, where there is um, um, two tribes turning against each other. By the way, this didn't happen before the invasion. So now we have two tribes in that particular province turning the, the, land, the Landus and against the Hamas, turning to each other. Um, there have been thousands of people that have been killed. As far as um, uh, aid is con uh, concerned, um, I think the United States has done, has done a lot um, in um, helping on the ground, but through uh, different NGOs, uh, they have done a lot. But um, publicly, uh, it's, very, it's very difficult to see what kind of aid is going to the people, because war also has uh, raised, actually, um, the, this epidemic of uh, AIDS, HIV. And there have been rumors, uh, some even said that there, there is uh, evidence that uh, Rwanda, uh, in particular, still have troops, because as we said at the beginning, that the Tutsis and uh, the Banyamulenge, you cannot differentiate them. They speak the same language. Uh, so they still have some troops that are there um, on, on, um, on the ground. But in truth, the situation in the eastern part of the Congo is still very confused. Uh, you have um, one person who still have an army, and he is being sought by an international criminal court for violation of human rights. And uh, he has some alliance with um, another person, a commander of a province, because they speak the same language, or they came from the same um, rebel fraction when they were during the war. And he goes and take or have influence on the, on, on the regular troops, and the regular troops will revolt against the, the national government, and they will start a war, or they will start a rebellion or insurrection, whatever we can call it. But that person is not intimidated, is still in the country, is, is not out of the country, but nobody can arrest him. Um, I don't know how do we call it. So, but that's the situation in the eastern part of the Congo. That's why even um, speaking about the election, that it will be very difficult not only to do a census, but also to have a real election there. And uh, what they are saying is uh, those who were in rebellion or those who were supporting the invaders, uh, the aggressors, don't have any interest to see a true democracy or to, to, to have a free and a fair election because they won't win. Um, many of them are in the government, but still they haven't yet answered for the crimes that they committed during that war. So uh, the situation is very confused in the eastern part of the Congo. We still have five minutes. If I could maybe expand my, on my earlier question. Um, the situation in, uh, in many African countries, uh, at least uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, I think makes it difficult sometimes for bodies such as the EU or the UN to understand exactly what, how the conflict is taking place. So much of it is ethnic, so much of it is warfare that perhaps uh, uh, isn't necessarily unconventional, but that we don't exactly know in the West or in the global North how to react to it. You were talking earlier about some of the squabblings and how that sort of prevented a lot of aid uh, in, in, the, in this particular conflict. How do you think um, the global North and uh, bodies such as the UN, how can they determine between, is it, is it going to be the same 
sort of criteria that we have uh, had in the past, or do we need to develop new criteria uh, in dealing with sub-Saharan African conflicts uh, specifically? Well, um, the criteria that I think is, first of all, the UN um, 